by Dr. Chen Ding Du, founder and CEO of Fire. Um, so modern computer vision started with object detection, segmentation, and tracking. AlexNet's win in 2012 ImageNet competition solidified deep learning. So we'll be bringing up how biologically inspired are deep learning nets. Um, uh, what could we better do for biological knowledge to help with deep learning? What are the future directions? So they're building the first AI augmented reality smartphone navigation solution for driving. Uh, previously worked on a postdoc at Harvard, Harvard research, researching neural inspired deep learning. Um, he received his PhD from Stony Brook University in computer vision and machine learning. He's been a National Science Foundation fellow, published over 15 publications in AI and cognitive science. So please help me have a warm applause for Dr. Chen Ping Yu. Thank you, Greg, for the introduction. And thank you guys for being here. Uh, bring it up? Yeah. And also, if you can silence any cell phones, that would be greatly appreciated. Hello? Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Chen Pingyu. I'm the founder and CEO of FIRE. Uh, today, the talk is going to be about neuro-inspired computer vision and deep learning. It's going to be most of what I've done during my PhD and postdoc, and I'd like to share that work with you guys. And, uh, but before that, let me introduce my company a little bit, as we are also hired. What we're working on is AI-powered AR navigation for driving. And the inspiration comes from when I was a postdoc at Harvard looking at this every day. I was driving Boston, the road path in Boston was ridiculous. Uh, looking at Google Maps like this, I had a lot of trouble figuring out what that blue route meant in front of me out of all the different roads. So I was making wrong turns all the time, and I also almost hit the curve a couple of times because I'm trying to figure out what the map is telling me and not really looking at what's in front of me. So I thought my phone was already mounted on the dashboard, the camera was facing forward, and the display was facing me. Why am I still reading a 2D map? Why can't someone show me a live video feed and overlay my route on that for me so I know exactly where to go? Um, and I thought, I, I can try to do that because my background is in computer vision. I, I realized there's a lag in the video, so try to interpolate your mind for me. Uh, this is showing an AR, AR navigation overlay of things, of the chevrons directly uh, onto the thing. <clears throat> and also with turn indicators at the turn showing you exactly where to go so that with a quick glance uh, you would know exactly where to go. We're also working with car makers and suppliers to build it into the cars by projecting the windshield and the uh, center console display. And, but, if you, uh, but that's going to take a couple of years and therefore right now we're, with, we're pushing for our, our smartphone app so that you can just download for free and use it um, by having a mount, uh, mount, mounting it on the dashboard. We are entering our beta at the end of this year, so if you're interested in joining our beta, please come to our website and sign up. And, but in order for us to build AR navigation, we have to do a lot of AI behind. So what, what, what that means is we need to detect objects, we need to segment uh, drivable road regions, road, um, sidewalks, and we need to detect lanes. Uh, not only that, we have to make them all run on the smartphone, all at the same time, in real time, not overheating the phone, uh, because we don't want it to be transferred to our server to, to kind of process. That's, uh, that could take time and also eat up all your data. So, so our expertise is also in efficient AI and computer vision, which I'm going to segue from that into the talk today. Okay. So today, uh, the rough agenda is that I'll first go over the computer vision background, and then I'll move into human vision system and models. That includes something called the Venture Stream uh, ventral stream network for categorical search and map CNN for learning location-based neurons, as well as feature directions. Uh, before I begin, can I see um, anybody familiar with computer vision? Can you raise your hand? Great. Um, what about deep learning? Anybody familiar with deep learning? Okay. How about anyone doesn't know anything about what deep learning is? Good. <laughs> uh, I. I'm, I'm hoping that most of us have some uh, foundational knowledge, so I'm, I'm, I'll be able to explain two things, and it seems to be that case. Thank you for that. All right, so first, what is computer vision? Computer vision enables computers to see and to understand the world. 
Some popular tasks, as you can see on the right hand side, is, for example, image classification to identify them into different categories, to detect objects such as bicycle, dog, and car, and join bounding boxes around them, and also segmenting into different semantic categories. And of course, there are more tasks such as tracking, depth, estimation, 3D, and more. Uh, and the typical processing stages of computer vision uh, is the following. First, you extract feature descriptors, and then you formulate a model. Then you perform inference on that to make predictions. So let's go through that a little bit, just for background. Why do we want to extract features from the image? Because when you're comparing a pot plant picture and a dog picture, they're different sizes. And so you can't just do a direct differencing. You need to extract, you need to quantify them into a feature vector so you can use that vector to compare with each other. And so the first step is we want to extract feature points out of the image. And first what we do is detect interesting key points using blob detectors or corner. As you can see in the motorcycle image, these are corner detected results. And those are interesting points where we want to extract features from. And then, so when we're extracting features from, the features what we can use include sift, surf, or just hog, blob, and color. So those basically turns, um, aggregates the gradient information around the key point and vectorize that into a feature vector. Now, when we have a bunch of feature vectors, how do we aggregate them into one single feature vector to describe a image? Uh, so, one popular approach, which you probably have never heard of if, uh, if you don't work on this, because that, that's something really before deep learning time, is something called bag of vision works. What that means is, uh, people realize that if you're looking at an object, it's really composed of object parts. For example, the motorcycle with all the different motorcycle parts. Now, if you have 10 different object categories, you can sort of make an um, bag of object parts as your visual vocabulary that you can use to, to create a histogram to, to, to describe every, uh, every image based on what kind of the object part this image has. And, and that's what you see on the second image is uh, if you have object parts uh, coming from violin, bicycle, and the painting of the woman, then if you make a histogram out of it, the woman image will have a histogram having higher, uh, higher frequency of the feature of the skin tone and the eye appearing, versus the bi bicycle have the bicycle part, and the violin has the violin part. And therefore, if you have another bicycle like it, you'll have a more similar looking histogram as a yellow histogram, so that you can compare that against each other. Uh, and then there's also spatial period, that meaning you can uh, separate the image into a different spatial grid to, to extract more spatial information. Other examples include spatial vector sparse coding. Sparse coding is at the bottom. That kind of, that kind of uh, resembles the early features of the CNN, because uh, sparse coding was actually learned. The features learned from the natural images rather than hand-crafted features such as SIFT, SERP. And, and that actually was done by Andrew Ng, who is now very well known for his different work. And after you have the feature vector of the image, you want to then inference, you want to predict something out of it. You want to predict what kind of class, it, what kind of category it is. Uh, and before deep learning time, the, the most popular method is using support vector machine. And, 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 and the reason why that works so well is because, because of kernel, uh, kernel methods, which is actually kind of related to deep learning as well. But in this case, let's take an example of the top image where you have the concentric circle data. And, and it has two different, uh, classes of uh, data points. Uh, one is in red as the outer ring, and then the inner ring is in blue. So there are two different classes. Given that data, if you just do a straight line trying to separate those two classes, you're unable to because they're not linearly separable. But one thing that support vector machine allows you to do is to use a kernel to really project the data into a higher dimensionality space. And that's shown on the right hand side of this top image. If you, if you cannot separate them on a 2D plane, what if you stretch them up into a 3D so that you can see that the yellow, sorry, uh, the red points are now up higher and the blue points are now lower, so then you can just use a hyperplane to, um, to separate them. So that gives you a really good separation and the classification, uh, which is what kernel methods is able to do for you. And also other classifiers include like Bayes decision tree, logistic regression, and data boost. At that time, there was already a convolutional neural network, but it wasn't working as well as SVM, and therefore most of the classifier was still using SVM at that time. So some other examples of computer vision, for example, uh, image segmentation using active contour as a top image if you first draw initialization of where the object is, and then that contour will kind of slowly form to, um, to conform to the object. Markov random field, conditional random field, these are graphical models on the se uh, second image, but by, by, by modeling gra a graphical model onto the image. Uh, object tracking using mean shift, which is to look for similar objects in the, 
in a surrounding neighborhood, an active appearance model for face tracking, and you have a predefined face model. If you move your face around, that model will morph and it'll track the face for you. Um, also, video action recognition includes using motion boundary histograms and histogram of optical flow. These are also handcrafted features that's using optical flow information. I think the theme here is that there's a lot of handcrafted features that, the old, that in the old days that people are using, but whether it's the feature or the model and, or the classifier, and also a lot of math. Right? All those different kind of things, these are the, the mathematical formulations for all the different methods I mentioned. And we're thinking, if, if right now what we're trying to do with computer vision is to, um, is to really build something that can work as well as human vision. So instead of building something in a different way, which is using mathematical machine learning uh, methods, what about what if we look into the actual system we're trying to mimic, which is a human visual system? So of course, a lot of people thought about that, and therefore, uh, Artificial neural networks really came about pretty early on with the introduction of Perception, that's uh, back in the 1950s. Uh, so Perception, as you can see from the first and second image, is that it's, it's a simplified artificial neuron, meaning if you look at the neuron's anatomy, you have the left side of the neuron has dense joints that receives input from other neuron, and after the input aggregates to a certain level, then the neuron will fire to its axon, and then that will trap um, travel to the next neuron that will receive it. And that's what exactly what perception is doing, and it's, make, it's, get, it's using a set of weights to do a linear uh, combination of the input to, and then going through a step function. Step function meaning if the output is less than zero, it won't fire, it'll just output a zero. If it's above zero, it'll output a one. And therefore, it always only do a binary classification, and it is a linear model. It does not solve any nonlinear problems. And because of that, it was very limited in, in its use case. Later on, fast forward uh, uh, 20 something years, we have multi layer perception that's using perception as a building block. Uh, with the introduction of back propagation, hidden layers, and, and nonlinear activation of sigmoids, which is really a smooth nonlinear version of the step function, then you have uh, something much more usable. But, <clears throat> but still, the, um, the, it was very promising, but then it really didn't get too much into. Uh, the, the top of the line accuracy, and with com convolutional neural networks introduction in 98 by Yama Kuhn, that was uh, still mostly going unnoticed until recently. The deep, deep neural networks from Alex Dan in 2012, uh, where they had revenue max pooling, and that really uh, exploded everything. So, all that background I'm trying to show you is that before 2012, everything has been statistical machine learning, and after that, it's been deep learning. And we used to call everything at, uh, machine learning. In fact, when I was uh, in PhD, my advisor used to tell me, you know, avoid using the word AI because that's bad branding. When you talk about AI, people think it's a bunch of detailed statements and conditions. Uh, that's, that, that's actually, it doesn't sound very smart. You want to just use machine learning. So I remember that until recently, everything now says AI. So AI definitely redeemed its name. Uh, machine learning is so good, but uh, it was an interesting uh, experience that I had where AI was bad branding now is everything we call it. So after deep learning came out, so this is just some graph showing the, uh, the, the improvements. On the, on the left hand side, that's image net classification, 1,000 categories. Before 2012, things are kind of progressing slowly. Afterwards, things just exploded. Same as object detection on the right hand side. Uh, things exploded after 2014. So it's very important. Uh, and it's also partially uh, biologically inspired because the artificial neural network from the perception was, based on, was actually based on the neuron. And I'll dig into that a little bit more later. And so before I dig into that, I want to kind of go through human visual systems and its models, because that's what uh, artificial neural network, convolutional neural network really kind of came from. Um, when, you're, when you're looking at a human visual system, it's not just the brain you're looking at. You're actually looking at several different abstraction layers. For example, there's a behavior, behavioral layer, meaning how do you react to what we see? When you're seeing something, you have a reaction or it takes some amount of time for you to find something. So those are the behavior side of things. There's also the topographical side of things, meaning how your brain is organized into a, um, a, a processing machine for this information. Uh, is it layered, or is, it, is there a feedback connection? Is there a lateral, is there a skip, and all of that. And then there's neuron, meaning how do neurons form and remove new connections? What kind of an activation function? How do you activate a neuron? Uh, how are, are there different types of neurons? For example, we're mostly talking about excitatory neurons today because excitatory neurons means neuron only fires positive values. In neural networks, you get zero or positive if you're using a regular activation function. 
But in your brain, if all your neurons are always firing positively, you're going to go nuts. So you need inhibitory neurons to inhibit a lot of the uh, activations. So there are neurons that fire, in a way, negatively to inhibit other neurons. So that's something, uh, for example, on a neuronal, a neuronal level that you can look at in, in a biological uh, neural network. Um, so now, if we know a little bit about human visual system, can we just take how human visual system works and implement them into a computational model? Uh, we can, but how much do we know about human visual system? Uh, so we know some, we, we actually know some parts pretty well, and a lot of parts we also don't know. And so the typical approach is that we usually implement what we already know, along with some assumptions, so that if it works as some task, we can dig back into that model to hopefully also learn more about how our visual system works from that model. So it, it is a little chicken and egg, but also you're able to dig back in. Um, so, so here, in order to do, to do this, uh, I'll give an example, which is to, we're gonna model a, 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 a more complex human visual behavior with a biologically possible model. And if it's successful, then we can look back into that model for more insights. Um, and that model can become the basis of a mini, mini uh, human visual system uh, uh, moving forward. And the behavioral task that we're going to look at today is something called a categorical search task. What categorical visual search means, if you're at a grocery store, you might be looking for a mushroom, you might be looking for uh, tomatoes or uh, broccoli. So those are the tasks you're doing every day that most of us take, uh, really, really don't think much about it. But it really, it's the amount of time for us to take the process of information to find things actually is very important in terms of illustrating, uh, in terms of implying how our brain is wired to process different information. And so it's not just an object detection where it's either this or that. It's about how do you find something and how fast and how accurate can you do that. So this is more complex. And to make it more specific, more detailed, is <coughs> there's typically, in, in, in this world, there's typically, you don't really think about it, but there's hierarchy of object categories. In this case, you're seeing this. Uh, this is a picture of vehicle, if you're looking at the superordinate level, which is the highest level of hierarchy. Or if you go down a little bit to the basic level, that's what cognitive science is called, then you call it car. If you go to the most detailed level, subordinate level, you call it taxi cab. So you can see that you can kind of label this picture in a different way. And in fact, it's, it takes human different amount of time to process that information, given the different kind of questions people ask you. And so let's give it a try. Uh, we're, what, what we want to kind of illustrate is how, how much time does it take for you to find things. So here, I want you to find airplane after I go to the next page, okay? So you probably found the airplane. It's over there. Now, next, let's try to find the vehicle on the next picture. Okay, so the vehicle is over there. So hopefully what you've, uh, what you've uh, experience is that it took different amount of reaction time for you to find those um, a vehicle versus an airplane because your brain actually processes those information differently and that has a lot to do with how the features are oriented and how the interconnections are being done and there's actually a pretty good uh, pretty good agreement of those processing time across everybody so what we did was we collected data from 26 college students and we showed them about 500 of those and that that kind of uh, that that included 48 subordinate subordinate categories that can be grouped into 16 basic categories, and then further grouped into four superordinate categories. And what we found was that overall people spent um, so the top graph is what's called time to target. That means how much time did it take for your eye to land on the correct target? And the second graph means ver uh, says verification time. That means how much time did it uh, did it take after your eye landed on target? you have to kind of verify, okay, I think this is it. <coughs> and then I click a button and says, okay, I'm sure about that. So that's what's called verification time. Um, and, and we found that at the most detailed level, that's people are fastest when, when they land to the object. And, but when people are verifying what the, if that's a car, if that's an airplane, uh, the basic level is fastest. So this is overall in terms of grouping uh, across, cat, across levels. Now, if we look at individual categories, you can see that so the white axis is reaction time. How much time does it take people to, to, to move their eye to the correct target? On the top hand side, we have, and on the top graph, we have uh, 48 different categories, subordinate categories. We have 18-wheeler, biplane, bunk cake, K-1, 
can be bad, chocolate cake, and so on. And, and a, a lot of different things. And you can see that there's different kind of variations in people's reaction time of finding something. Um, when you go into basic level, there's also some difference there. And in the superordinate level, there's, again, differences there. Uh, the, the bars may not seem very different, but that's because the scale is a little different. So what we want to do here is that if people are able, if people have this really, um, really common reaction time in general, and if that says something about how your brain works, what if we try to predict these numbers using some model? If we can predict that, if we can predict how fast it takes for a person to find an airplane on the Magoo, then maybe that model is doing something that we can further look into. Okay, so this is the more complex uh, behavior that we want to kind of look into than just classifying the classification or detection. So it's a reaction time we're looking for. Um, so in, in, in order for us to do that, at first we have to kind of hypothesize something. Remember I said uh, there's some things we know, some things we don't. In this case, we hypothesize how do we learn new categories. And this is actually also related to how we can use um, neural networks. Is when you're seeing an object category for the first time, this, uh, for, for example, dragon fruit in a grocery store, what you would do is you'll probably look at a bunch of dragon fruits and you'll find the commonalities between them. For example, you'll see, okay, they all look kind of pink, they all look ellipsoid, smooth texture, extruding green petals, so that kind of defines what a dragon fruit is. In that, in, uh, when you're looking for, so that's when you're looking for, you're extracting category consistent features or the category representative features of those uh, examples, and you're kind of extracting, and the features you're looking for are from a feature pool of your brain that has been trained throughout your lifetime experience. So, and, and that's key here, that you have, in your brain you already have this feature pool that you can draw features from. <coughs> you're just looking for what features I, uh, represent this object, right? And so then the question is, how do we pick those features out of the feature pool? And also, where do we get the large feature pool from? Um, and another uh, related Related thing here is when you're training a neural network for object detection and classification, it's very different. You usually have to have negative examples. Meaning, when you're learning, when you're feeding a new dragon fruit to the um, uh, to the network, you need to train it with non-dragon fruit categories. For example, chairs, uh, desk, computer, people. Right? That's how a neural network learns. But when you're learning a new category, you're not thinking about, oh, I'm learning dragon fruit, so what's not a dragon fruit? You're not thinking about that. You're purely thinking about that object itself. You're looking for the representative features. So that's what we want to kind of go in with. And, and, and our hypothesis is that uh, maybe what happens is the more, the more object consist um, category consistent features there are of a category, the faster it is for you to match something. Because it'll, it'll, it'll basically mean that you have a more detailed template of the object so that you can match faster. So that's our hypothesis. And we, and so we went out to build, build that. Um, and we thought, so first we need a large feature pool to extract feature from. Where can we get that from? Oh, neural network has a bunch of features in, in, this, uh, in this convolutional filters. Right? So just to recap, when you have a neural network, it's, uh, it's learning different, uh, different levels of details of features from the early layers to the later layers. Uh, in this case, if you're learning a face, you have more edge-like features and face parts in the middle and then more like complete face later on. So, what we want to do is, probably for, and, but this neural network probably was trained for uh, different categories, face, people, chair, desk, so on. So then we want to find a way to, for example, maybe these are the, uh, these are the convolutional filters that are specifically uh, important to a face. And then there might be another set of features that's important for chairs. So the, and then we just count how many features there are that can kind of use that to correlate with the amount of uh, time that it takes for you to find things. Okay. And but so, so another question, when we were looking at that, we thought, okay, so that's pretty good, but then there's so many different neural networks, which one do we use? They all have different kind of features. So in the end, we thought, if we're trying to model human uh, visual perception here, then, and if we're assuming that feature pool is where your, your brain um, keeps all the features, then shouldn't we actually build a neural network that's modeled after the brain, so that all the features that we're extracting from there, maybe would have li higher likelihood to kill the success instead of just using arbitrary neural network, which really everything was designed for accuracy of some classification or, de or detection task, not really for um, um, replicating the, um, the structure of the brain. And so that's all we did. What we, um, and, and, and what we did was we looked into all the literature and um, basically this is the overview of human visual cortex, which is uh, when your eye takes in information, it passes to the 
this little nut like little ball thing in the middle of your brain that's called LGN that act as a relay relay point to relay all the visual information to the back of your brain and that's and that's the visual cortex that processes all your visual information and the visual cortex roughly does take some layers and there's the uh, the first visual layer is called V1 the second visual layer is called V2 there's V3 V4 and then you get into uh, closer to the front of your brain so the second image shows that in fact your visual processing takes two pathways one is it, along the top of your head, it's processing motion. It's called the dorsal stream, the motion, the, the um, processing motion. And then when you're going through the bottom of your brain, that pathway of processing processes object detection and, is what, and, and that's called the ventral pathway. And so in this case, we care more about ventral pathway because we're doing object-related things. Uh, and then we also look further down, be like, what are the kind of uh, separations of layers in the brain? And then we found V1, V2, V4, T, O, T, um, T O T E at the bottom of our image showing that's kind of the, the, the pathway of the ventral stream. And we also looked into is there different skip connections? How, I mean, right now with residual net, they just skip um, all the time, right? Uh, but is there some parts of your brain having skip connections, some parts that, that don't have it? Uh, and also, we also found that at different layers of your visual cortex, the, there's a range of receptive field sizes. For example, if you have any kind of network today, each layer has usually has a fixed size of the receptive field, uh, but in your brain it's a range. And also it's a map-like topography, which I'll get into after. So let's recap on receptive field, and that was really important in terms of building this visual uh, ventral stream network. Is uh, that question? Yeah. Uh, would you mind posting up those slides in a PDF form or power or on the Meetup site? Yeah, sure. Yeah. To them after the talk. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, receptive field pretty much means how, what, what is the visual area for each neuron that can process in your brain. So on the top, uh, on the, the top image is uh, it's showing how the neural network will see things. The, the layer that's clo closest to the image will see a small part of it, but when, when information is streaming upward, then the, the, a single neuron will cover actually larger visual field because of the aggregation of the lower level neurons. And in, in terms of uh, biology, Especially human and primates, typically, in fact, the, the receptive field is not um, is not the same in all layer. In a, in it's um, it's actually smaller when this. Um, I'll, I'll talk about it next time. But here we found that there's a range of receptive fields. So as you can see from the table down here, for different uh, layers in your in your visual cortex, the receptive field size for V1 is 0.25 degrees to 2 degrees. So degree is the unit that we use to describe how, how big uh, you're seeing the field, the, the viewing area. As on the bottom image you can see, as a human, your typical viewing area is about 70 degrees total, so 35 here, 35 there. And then more of the preferred viewing area is 15 left, 15 to the right. And, and now you can kind of imagine how small 0.25 to 2 degrees is for the first level of your neurons. And then as you move, uh, toward the hierarchy into the TE, which is now toward the front of your brain, and then those neurons, because it gets information from all the neurons before, so that actually gets up to 70 degrees of information. Um, yeah, so, not, but, but not just that, in fact, there's a lot of details, for example, the, the, um, the neurons that are processing information closer to the center of what you're fixating, they would have smaller receptive fields. Toward the periphery, the receptive field is usually much larger, um, so I'll, I'll go over kind of all of it. So all those all the, so we took all those information to to build what we call the ventral stream network. Uh, vent ventral stream network. What it does is we every layer now kind of uh, depicts one visual cortex layer. In this case, also, and what we try we, we try to do is we try to make sure the receptive field size of each layer is within the actual receptive field size of your brain of that layer, and we also. Um, in terms of the, and, and that required us to add different, um, different sizes of kernels at each layer. And the number of kernels uh, within each layer was also designed based on how many neurons was processing um, at that receptive field versus how many at the larger, uh, larger range. So, and also we had the skip connection based on what was uh, found in the brain. For example, V1 has a skip connection to V4, but that skip connection was rather weak. It wasn't a full skip connection like everything else. So we use a different color to indicate that. And also skip connection in the brain is not like a summation like residual net. It's more like concatenation. 
because information are kind of aggregated together. So we also use concatenation for SNP. Um, yes. And also we use the surface area of your brain to estimate how many neurons per layer we should add. And basically the, the result is that we built this neural network purely based on all the information of what we can found from the brain's topology, uh, topography and not based on the accuracy of whatever this can achieve by image then or something else. And what we want to do is now, after having this network that we think is as close to, to the best we can do to be a, um, to the topography of the brain, now let's train this on image then and let's see what happens. And can we then find important features for, to, um, to predict people's reaction time for object searching? You may have mentioned this, but are these CNN, what, are these CNN, these little blue boxes, or are you going to get into that? So, so every blue blue box is a layer. It's a it's a convolutional layer of this uh, of this convolutional neural network, and there's five convolutional layers, um, like fully connected layer, and those are for classification purposes. Yeah. And for other, oh, can you repeat the question for them? Oh, oh sorry. So he was asking, uh, what are the blue boxes? Okay. A, a question uh, back on the blue boxes. So the three by three convolutions and the five by five are they looking at the same? input pixels, or is there a center section that's three by three pixels? That's a very good question. And so, then a surrounding yeah. perimeter of five by five. Right. Um, so the question was, are those three by three, five by five, seven by seven in the same layer uh, at different spatial locations, or they're uh, sharing the same? So in this case, in this network, we did not build spatial location uh, specific neurons. But in the next part, I'll talk about that. Actually. Okay. Yeah, one, one more question, yeah. too, is to you were talking about the computation time or the reaction time. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I guess that when I think of a, a network like this, I think of it as being constant time computation because it's you know five steps um, of computation for every image. Can can you kind of say what the assumption is there for yeah. the variable time? And the question is how um, the, the, react, the reaction time, how is it? Uh, it looks like in, in this neural network, everything's constant time all the time going through the five layers. How do you predict different uh, reaction time of people searching for things? So, we're not using the forward pass time to predict uh, to predict the reaction time. We are going to train this network so that this network has a total of 729 filters that's going to be learned from say image things, and then that becomes our hypothesized feature pool of what you have in your brain that you've gathered throughout your lifetime. Okay, and then we will just what we do is we have a method to pick to find objects uh, represented category specific uh, features out of those 729. And the number of those uh, category consistent features would, would directly correlate with the reaction time. So is that, that part of things, it's the number of category representative features, not the four past time. So that is actually a separate model there. Okay. But I didn't go too, too much into that because, uh, all right, and, and we have to compare. We can't just build something and not compare. Uh, the reason why we use Alexan to compare is because we, our network happens to be five layers, and Alexan has five layers. And o overall, the number of uh, neurons are com roughly comparable. Ours have 729, and, and Alexan has 1152. Um, so we use that to compare. We also built another biologically inspired network that we call the HMAX. So this is based on a work called HMAX model from Thomas Sayre, 2007. 2007. It's, a, it's also a biologically inspired uh, visual cortex model, uh, as you can see on the bottom image. So we just purely follow that image, and, but just build a, a, a CNN version of that. And that's what you see, it looks very different. Uh, it's a two-stream network that ultimately combines. And, and, and with all of that put together, we have a number of neurons, 1760, that's a lot of neurons. And so what we, so, so, so we hypothesize one, those three are our, uh, our at our candidate brain feature pool uh, model. So after we train them on ImageNet, we want to find features out of them for each ca object category to use that to predict reaction time. And directly going to results, so, so what, what that shows is we have um, the back of our model, we actually build a back of our model, and because back of our model is also a, um, a handcrafted way of feature, getting a feature pool. We have AlexNet, uh, we have HMAX and VSNet on the right hand side. And this is a correlation of uh, our model's result correlated with human reaction time. So the higher the better. And when you see the uh, gray, gray zone, that means human performance. If we use a human to predict other people's time. 
So we can see that uh, VSNet actually, um, VSNet-based feature pool uh, was consistently into human performance. Whereas if you, use, if you extract features out of AlexNet for, um, for, for this work, AlexNet was very terrible. It's, um, it's usually the worst. And HMAC is also pretty good, but uh, not as good as the Venture Stream Network. And from that, we, can, we were also able to dig back into the model to see which of the layers contributed to different levels of hierarchical category search time. And we found that um, VSNet layer one had the most, the most importance in the subordinate level reaction time. And for basic level was also the earlier layer, which is the more detailed uh, edge-like features. And that kind of makes sense, because when you're looking for uh, something like a taxi cab, it has more information. You need more uh, lower level features to, to identify that. And then when you go to superordinate, you can see that then the, the, um, the more complex object templates are more important, and, and therefore the, low, the, the later layers are more important. Do you have a question? Yes. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I guess you, you, you didn't want to get into too much how do you do the reaction times, but just to understand sure. the, the gist. How do you decide if there is relevant features or not to the category? Is that by a human deciding this, looking at the, at the features, or mm -hmm. just to get a uh, yeah. So the question is, how do you uh, how do you decide what are the category consistent features out of this feature pool? So the the simple answer is that uh, we we hypothesized that the features that appear frequently and reliably would be the features for that object category. So what we did was we forward passwords for the hundred uh, pictures of taxi cab, and then we'll find the features that that out of those hundred images always light up and also has a uh, um, low standard deviation of activation. So those would be the features I would pick as, as important features for TaxiCAD. Because other features will light up some, some time or not at all, and those are not important for this category. So we do that for every category, so we have a set of uh, important features for different categories. And that's so then you say the more features that don't vary, the faster the reaction. Well, the more, so the question is then, well, so yeah. Just ask it again, it's like. So the more, num so the actual count of the number of those features would actually correlate with reaction time. Meaning, if your object template is larger, then if an object category requires a larger, more detailed template, that that helps you to uh, have faster reaction time. Uh, essentially, that's what it means. And, and that's the here. Uh, yes, question. I don't understand. Let, let, let's focus, for example, on the basic part with these four histograms. No? <coughs> uh, what, for example, what are? Tell me the name. What are these? The, 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 the little, the light blue, then the more oh, dark sorry. blue. For example, yeah. what, what would be this case? Sorry. So the question was asking what are, what color is this button? So the labels down bottom, I guess it's hard to see, but. If you count from the left to right, the four bars, the left one is the handcrafted feature using back of work model. The, the second one is AlexNet. The, the third one is DeepHMAC. And the fourth one is the Venture, uh, Venture Stream Network. And the idea is the higher the better. In, in here. I, I see. So, so and the gray zone is a human performance. If you use human to predict the other, the other human. Group. OK, uh, different algorithms to classify that, that uh, feature. Correct, yeah. yeah. Okay. We have a different but, algorithm to find features. But, but, so, so my point is this now. But the assumption was that to classify a subordinate and the basic requires different times, no? Different, uh, to classify a subordinate and basic requires different types? Times. times. Different times, yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, look, yes. looking at this picture, it doesn't seem so. It doesn't seem that it's not so looking at this picture, this shows the uh, correlation. So it just shows that if your overall prediction correlates with the data, then your bar will be higher. So the time can be very different, but this is a summary of the how good the, your prediction correlates with the human data. That's all. Um, and we also compared how it, how it was training on ImageNet because again it was it was not designed to do well on ImageNet. It was designed to match the brain. Um, but interestingly, what happened was AlexNet's top line accuracy was 57.7, DeepHMAX 59.6, and but DeepHMAX has a lot more uh, uh, neurons, so maybe that gave them more degrees of freedom. But in VSNet, we only had. Uh, 730 neurons <coughs> compared to Alex as uh, 1,000. So we had much less neurons, but it, it worked um, somewhat better. So that was also very interesting to see because it wasn't designed to do better. Okay, so these are some of the features visualized. And these are the, op 
um, category representative features for some class. I'm not sure if you can guess what it is, but this is a this card. You can see that the sign right here um, tires the windows and uh, the headlights. So, so the visualization is basically where we are um, we're lining up the, the activation area of a specific neuron. Okay? So this is the top uh, top ten neurons for the uh, for the for the police car class, and that seems to make a lot of sense. And even think that would the, the police works. It's very interesting. Another example here is uh, the taxi cab category. You can see that it's picking up the taxi sign. Um, also, another important feature for that is wheels and um, windows and the taxi. The, the taxi sign again. So as you can see, they, they actually share a couple of different things. For example, they both have wheels in it because they're all vehicles. So this model then also allows us to do more different things. For example, to really understand how different categories of objects relate to each other in terms of the features that, that describe them. And the third example here is a biplane. Biplane is a two-winged uh, plane. You can see the propeller, the, the tail, the wheels, and also the um, um, and then we also further try to use it as an object detector because if we already have uh, object specific, object representative features, and whenever we forward pass an image, uh, it'll produce a feature map of activations. Why don't, what if we just aggregate those category specific features uh, activations? Can we just get object location directly? And it actually turns out to be okay. So. This really gave us free object detector, meaning that, uh, for the airplane category, if we just aggregate all the, uh, the, the important features for airplane, airplane shows up, and also for different kind of categories, uh, some other examples you know, for the dog category, the uh, airplane, a bicycle, and it works actually pretty well. Okay, cool. So the next part I want to go into is for the question that Greg asked is, uh, what about what about, um, did, did you actually build neurons that, that process specific uh, locations? So that is a major difference between convolutional neural network and a human, um, human visual system, is that when you're dealing with a CNN, you have a filter that's convolved, slide across the image. So you're kind of sharing that feature across everywhere of your, of your visual field in that sense, which is not what's going on here because your neuron doesn't move. It stays at one spot. It looks at one spot in front of you, and therefore, when you're looking at what's in front of you, you have a grid of neuron that covers your entire visual field, everything looking at just one thing at a time. And that's how your, your brain works. And that's what's called the math structure that we want to explore here. And that, so that was the next work, which is to build in this math structure. And we also want to build in what's called an eccentricity effect, meaning there's more neurons that process information closer to the center of the visual field, and then less neurons in the periphery. Uh, but in CNN, usually that's because everything's shared, so there's no such a thing. Um, and also, there's uh, people found that the neurons that, that process your central visual field is, takes uh, response higher to blob-like images, uh, blob-like patches, whereas the surrounding visual fields, the neuron likes to process more the edge-like uh, kind of tuning. So that's something we want also. What well, we want to build in the first part, which is we want to build in more neurons in the middle of your visual field and less on our side, and see if we can, um, if training that model will actually learn something like more block-like uh, features in the middle and more edge-like features outside. And then there's also something called cortical magnification. That means the uh, receptive field size is, for the neurons is smallest around where you're fixating at, and then larger at the periphery. And that is uh, indicated at the bottom images. So the bottom images is showing that if you have this kind of a dartboard a pattern, just kind of um, just to map out your visual field in degrees, meaning the the blue circle is where you're fixating on, and when you go outside, that's to where your periphery visual field. If you if you overlay that to your brain in the visual cortex, in fact, and and that's the bottom, and and you'll see that almost half of your visual cortex is processing just the very center of where you're looking at, and that's why the color. Uh, color corresponds the blue of the center takes up about oh, almost half of your visual cortex, and then as you go outside, it, 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 it's the other, it's the other, yeah. The, when when you go outside, the receptive field is also smaller, and the number of neurons is much less. And take this Obama image for example. So that's what would kind of illustrate this. 
uh, the, the neurons that look at the center of the image have smaller receptive field as the neurons move outside, uh, that live outside that have larger receptive field. So how do we build all of that into a neural network? And, and so the goal is, if we build all that into a neural network and we train it, we want to see what exactly does it learn. We want to see what are those groups of neurons learn to become. And, and does that kind of reflect what we already know in the brain? Does that give us more insight? So that's what we call maps in it, is that in order for us to build this kind of neuron, so one thing is we can manually tie all those neurons at smaller receptive fields around the center and then larger around outside and then even larger around outside, which is going to take forever. What we did was we found maybe we can just transform the image itself and that could, maybe that could work. So we found a barrel transform to be very useful, is that if you perform barrel transform to an image, the image is warped such that, um, warped backward, so that What's in the middle of the image is magnified, um, and what's around this, the surrounding of the image is now much smaller. But and after you transform the image that way, then you then you, if you have locally connected uh, neurons, which is you just place the neuron just as a grid, like just say place neurons as a grid, and then the neuron that's toward the inside has a certain receptive field that might be divided by five by five that covers an area, and on the outside is also divided by five by five. But because of that warping. Uh, the, the, the peripheral neuron actually gets more information because this smaller red circle actually uh, takes all the information on the outside. And this also helps us to have <coughs> more neurons in the middle than, than outside because when you grid it this way, um, it already takes that into account. So we built a five layer neural network uh, with V1, V2, V3, and then two more. Again, very, very stringent to all the design uh, parameters based on all the information in the brain, for example, recept receptive field sizes. Um, and also number of them. And for every pixel, we want we also gave it 16 neurons at every pixel for it to learn. So hopefully, we thought hopefully that was enough to learn different kind of things at every visual location. And overall, we have 83 by 83 number of neurons in the grid. So that so you can think of that as like a volume of your visual cortex, right? It's it's layers of neurons. Every layer is processing, is learning different kind of information of what's in front of you. And, and you can directly just slap that grid onto the image because uh, each neuron processes spe specifically that spatial location. Um, yes, so the biggest issue here is, uh, is number of parameters. When you, uh, we want to go bigger with 32 neurons or more, but then the, because you're not sharing waves, you're not doing convolution, that means one filter across. You're having one filter at every uh, every pixel. And then 16 of them at every pixel. It just explodes in terms of number of parameters. So this was the best we can do uh, with the graphics we had. And so what we want to then find is will there be different filters to learn at different visual fields? And and then what we already know is there should be more blob-like filter, uh, filters around the center of the visual field and more edge-like tunings further away. So first, let's see if that's kind of verified. So we train the network with two data sets, one is image net, one is places, because they show you different kind of information. One's object, one's scenes. So what we did was, uh, we took the first layer, V1, of the learned filters, and then we convolve these test filters with the learned filters to see what kind of response we get. So what that would mean is, if filters resemble the test filter, we'll have a higher response. And this, this grid, corresponds to the visual area grid of the neurons where they, they live in. And it really was very, very interesting because we, we, we didn't design it this way, but it learned to be that there's more blob like filters in the middle, and there's more of the horizontal filters on top and bottom, and then the diagonal off the side, and also straight off the uh, two sides. So that's, a, that's more of a concentric circle pattern. And that kind of verifies what, what neuroscience has found in the visual system. And kind of similar thing happened in places to, to apply data sets. Well, it's not as clear, but you can kind of see that uh, block-like filters in the middle and then uh, horizontal at, at the top and bottom and the diagonal outside. So those are those were very encouraging results. And then we, we look further into what's what, what we call a hyperslice, which means so this would just be a slice of your of your group of neurons that's processing your visual system. Let's actually zoom in and see what are each individual neurons at different spatial locations are, are they looking for. So when we first look at the center visual field, it looks like there's a lot of different um, alternate, alter, alternating color and orientation filters, as well as uh, different uh, location-based filters. 
And, and when you move to the periphery of the visual field, you see things are more slanted, like the, the edge-like stuff, the more like an edge detector, and also a slightly different kind of color distribution. And this was for the, uh, this one was a model that was learned from ImageNet. And when we look into places data set, there was a weird pattern in the back, uh, as you can see, which we couldn't make out of. But then we, we kind of zoom into them. We, we look at what's up top and what's up in the bottom. Up top means what, do you, what are the features that are processing kind of your upper visual field. And we saw that there were a lot, of, a lot more uh, blue kind of filters, whereas the, the, the bottom visual field had a lot of uh, red filters. So that kind of was, it, was interesting also because when you're looking out into places or scenes, um, the sky is up top and then the ground is at the bottom. And that will correspond to a different color that, uh, that was here. So this really says a lot about filters in your brain is really location dependent. Not, you don't have features that are kind of uniformly distributed everywhere. They're optimized to um, your experiences that you've gone through. And that's why when things are upside down, it's harder for you to recognize because you're not, you, your brain's not tuned that way. And that's why you have also more of a blue filters up, up top and uh, red filters uh, down the bottom. So that, uh, these were the things that we, we found. And, and then we kind of look at the numbers. Uh, so we, 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 because we only had 16 filters per pixel for our uh, map CNN, so we modified AlexNet to have only 16 uh, filters in the first layer, just to try to make it more com uh, comparable. And what we found is that uh, on image then in places, uh, the, the map like CNN um, underperforms than, than, than AlexNet. AlexNet is at 48.8%, uh, top of accuracy, and uh, map CNN is at 40.9%. So it's not a huge difference, but and, and also over 1,000 categories is, is not a bad number, but it's just not better than AlexNet. So we thought that perhaps maybe what's happening is because in ImageNet, not every object is centered uh, centered in your image, and if you're learning like a spatially uh, oriented filter set, then you better make sure all information is in the center, or else you're not really processing them fairly. And so some kind of attention mechanism is required because. Uh, when you're looking out of uh, this room, maybe the, um, the, the projector is over there at the upper visual field, but you would move your eye to look at that such that that's centered in your view. So that's when things are being processed. So what we lack was the, the attention mechanism. And then, um, and then I found, oh, in fact, we don't even need to try that. Deep Face already validated that for us. So Deep Face was a paper by uh, Facebook that was doing a, a whole bunch of different face uh, recognition tasks. So what they did was, they pretty much built the same network as what we did, but they had different, slightly different parameters. For example, the first layer, they had 32 filters at each pixel, and, and then they have different number of layers, and the details are different. But as you can see, their, their network was, was also able to learn uh, spatially constrained filters, and that's, ex that's exactly just a face. And so what they did was they first detect a person's face, and then they would kind of align that to the center of the image before passing that through the network. So that's the attention mechanism that we lacked. Because then even though this person's face in the original image was in the center, but after aligning, that would be. And then now you can kind of utilize all the spatially oriented filters to the best of how uh, they can do. And, and with that work, they, I, at the time, they were state of the art of uh, a lot of popular data sets. So that was a separate way of validating uh, this is. Uh, and also a promising approach. So finally, we come to the uh, possible future directions. With all that we've, we've, we've kind of tried to do, a lot of it is at the topographical level and also the behavioral level. What about the neuronal level? So, for, so like I said, there's neuron types that, that we haven't really looked into that, that includes inhibitory neurons that offer negative values. Um, connection types, there's now a lot of RNNs around. And RNNs needs to be, uh, recurrent neural network needs to be optimized using backpropagation through time, but that is very memory inefficient. In fact, it's whenever you unroll, you unroll it, it takes a lot of memory. So, and, and therefore, when you're building a large RNN or a lot of different lateral or feedback connections, it just makes it harder and harder to train. So, and, and one way to look into that is because, um, and we have to look into that because the brain is a huge recurrent network with a lot of feedback connections. Uh, so one way to look at it is to use distributed learning methods, for example, something called heavier learning. Um, heavier learning is a, a way, it's an, it's an abstraction of how the brain forms new connections. And the, the famous saying is, neurons that fire together, wire together. 
a given example in the bottom image is that if you have a neuron on the left-hand side that is firing to the neuron on the right-hand side, and at the same time, that right-hand side neuron is also firing, they fire at the same time, then their connection will, will grow, will strengthen. So because this, because this is purely based on two neurons, so you can, um, you can do that, just distribute it um, anywhere on the network at different times. It doesn't have to be step-by-step uh, -step of back propagation to time one layer um, after another. So that's something uh, could be very interesting. There's some group doing that, but uh, so far, there hasn't been much success. They were able to only train small networks of maybe three layers. Uh, so still a very active research area. But those would be very interesting things to look into. Um, so with that, I could uh, conclude our talk. Uh, my, my talk. Thank you, and we're also hiring for a bunch of different roles. So if you're interested in computer vision, SLAN, uh, iOS, and if you're a product manager, uh, please come in. Thank you. People that were more purist and biologically inspired <clears throat> would be more worried about backpropagation because neurons just, information just flows in one direction. You know, uh, if you're doing gradient descent, then you're backpropagating. Um, I guess you're kind of looking at what you can be inspired from but not worrying about all the constraints. Uh, so the question is the. Uh, the question some... is um, if you're being rigorous about being biologically inspired. You couldn't have back propagation. I I want to say that is true. So the question is because if you're very information just flows through neurons in one direction. There's no back propagating or right. So so the question is if you are very very strict to a biologically inspired uh, neural network architecture and learning, then would there not be back propagation? I I I think the probably that there isn't because like because like you said there's. All sorts of different things happen in the neurons. They remove, they remove connections, they strengthen connections. Um, in fact, there could be... So I'm not a neuroscientist, uh, and so I can't really answer that to the full extent, but I understand that there are different ways of how neurons form connections and remove. So um, it definitely doesn't sound just like propagation. Maybe parts of it is like that, but definitely not all of it. Um, yes. On uh, slide 25, uh, Show that the um, fastest verification time was for the intermediate basic level, and I was just wondering why do you think that is? Um, the question is why do we why do we think that is that the verification time is fastest at the basic level? So because that that was actually pretty uh, well understood understood and also explained is that we are very comfortable. Um, um, describing an object at the basic level. When you're looking at cars, you kind of just talk about cars, chairs, table, desk, phone, uh, projector. These are all basic level. Um, this could be like a conference chair. That would be a subordinate level. But usually people don't get to that detail. So people are used, uh, very, very used to uh, basic level identification. And that may be why verifying is fastest and most comfortable at, at that level. But uh, my kid is two years old, and I realized he's very good at subordinate car categories. He's, he would say, that's a pickup truck, that's a uh, van, that's a taxi, that's a bus. Uh, so in fact, I'm having my sec second kid, and I'm going to document what kind of object categories my second kid is going to learn throughout the time, so I can maybe figure out what's the progression of the different hierarchical levels of objects that, that we learn. Well, I'm just wondering why it Somehow it seems like it should be, you know, kind of linear, like the top graph. Why is it the basic is, why are we best at that? Mm -hmm. I see. So why, so we are best at describing, so the question is why, why do we have basic having advantage in verification, but not like the trend at the top, for the time target? Um, that's a good question. I think I just know the answer is that there, there's widespread um, knowledge of what's called basic level superiority, meaning we're just super comfortable at, at describing things and finding things using the basic level representation. Um, but why that is, I think it's interesting to look at. Why wouldn't that be fastest at time to target? Why wouldn't that? That's a additional research topic we can look into. <laughs> Maybe it's just a heavy and fires frequently. You see it very frequently and you get faster at it. So anything, and so maybe with your child that sees a fire truck, 
50 times a day, he's firing that very fast, and he gets faster at it. Possibly. Possibly he just remembers that as his fire truck rather than just, just remember that. Of repetition. Yeah. yeah. Um, with spike neural nets, do you see any any advantage to using that kind of idea, or is it is it you're not dealing with that aspect of? Uh... So spiking the um, the question was what about spiking neural nets? Can can they be made more biologically spiked? So there's different types of neural network for sure. I think spiking neural nets they produce spike traits of a uh, of this, uh, from a stimulant, right? And I think in that respect, it's trying to replicate the actual firing of uh, a fire frequency pattern of a, of a neural network. Uh, perhaps we can make it a combination of a convolutional spiking neural net. I think maybe there is such a thing. And I, I think one thing that I found is um, there's such segregation between different fields. For example, computer vision, they are very, um, all they care about numbers. It, 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 it's all about accuracy. It's all about comparison to different data sets. It's all about, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but um, in neuroscience, they, they care about how things are kind of um, how things work in the brain, and then in the biological, uh, in, a, uh, in the bioengineering side of things, people look into a spiky neural net, which is kind of similar to, which is a, which is a type of neural net, but they surprisingly don't know much about convolutional neural net at all, um, and it would be and and you also see a lot of sorry very few collaborations between uh, different fields because you would think if computer vision scientists and neuroscientists, they work together, they could find a lot of new things. Or if you see computer vision scientists work with um, the uh, bioengineering scientists with spiky neural net, they could maybe find new things, but they usually work separately, and that's kind of sad because um, they, they move in parallel rather than trying to come up with things. And I think combining them, like you said, if we if we have more, if what if we combine some things with spiky neural net, that could be interesting. Well, some of that may be a power issue or, you know, Reduce the amount of energy involved. Or Not sure power. Um, no, but I think we can take that off. Oh, question, sorry. So, uh, in human cognitive system, uh, imagine also that the part, like when you are driving and the weather is bad, you can see the land, but you imagine there's supposed to be a land. Like when the pen is fading, you can see land lines, but you imagine there is a What's not actually in the picture? So, so do you have a, like a similar system to mimic similar features? You. Yeah, the question is, if you're driving in brain and the lanes are really reflective, you can't see it, but you can kind of guesstimate where that is. Uh, so what, what is there a mechanism there we can replicate? Uh, that's actually a really interesting question because for my startup, when we're doing AR navigation, we need to detect, detect lanes so that we can align our chevrons to, to align the lane. Um, and a lot of times there's no lane markings, but then you can kind of see this is where you're supposed to drive. So we trained our model on, um, so we asked people to label on, on images without residential area areas where there's absolutely no lane markings. Just to, we asked them to mark, label lane lines when there are lane markings and also label lane lines where there, there isn't. Just label it as you think they, if there's supposed to be one. And the network was able to learn. So, and that didn't need to be balanced by it. But I think, in terms of the mechanism, I'm not very sure how that works. Uh, that, that could be also an interesting topic to look into, for sure. So the question is, uh, we showed that VSNet has better performance than AlexNet and VBH Max, but not the state of the art neural networks. How would, um, and how would yeah, that work? Yeah, right, yeah. So um, definitely valid question, but to us, because we created VSNet to roughly have five layers, and also this, and based on all the different design constraints, they only left us with 729 neurons. And all of those are, were actually based on the neural constraints. So we thought that the more we, we wanted to make it more apples to apples comparison because if we have say if we have a ResNet 50 or ResNet 100, you have I don't know thousands of neurons to pick from, then uh, that may not be a the, the best fair comparison that we can we can make. 
and therefore we use LSM because in terms of the architecture, it has five layers. In terms of the number of neurons, it's kind of similar. But uh, it was definitely something we thought about in terms of the extension work is to try to use more steady art network. For example, even make VSNet to have sub layers because in V1, there's also sub layers there, in V2 sub layers. In here, we just have a single uh, convolutional layer from V1, V2. So if we make more sub layer, sub layers, maybe then we can compare with the state of the networks more fairly. That, that's your question. Yeah, yeah, the question is why why do we want to why do we care yeah, about biological? So the the goal here is that if all you care about is accuracy, probably you don't you don't need to care about biologically inspired uh, network now. But what I, our hypothesis is that even though right um, that the, the idea is that when we're creating computer vision uh, uh, models, the goal is to be as close to human vision system <clears throat> as much as we can. And therefore uh, maybe then we should draw inspirations from what we're trying to beat, which is the human vision system. And that's why we want to make things more biologically inspired, so that even though right now maybe things start slowly, but those knowledge will build up. And as you find more things that work and that kind of makes sense, then hopefully one day it'll just kind of go go down. Yeah. Uh, question. Kind of Greg's comment about gradient graded descent. I mean, the whole rehearsal mechanism of taking a data set and then kind of randomly sorting it and presenting it in fixed frequency random order that you have to do to do the gradient descent, all of that, that, there isn't evidence really for that happening. So when you're talking about biologically inspired, you, you're kind of both looking at the architecture but also looking at how the these algorithms work and what do you have to do underneath in order to get them to... Right, so the question was... <clears throat> there's a lot of rehearsing mechanism that we're working uh, that, that we're doing. That's not kind of the neural side of things. So, uh, and, and, and I totally agree. And that's why we had an algorithm that's about how we learn to recognize a new category. Remember, that's uh, instead of training a new neural network with native examples, we just look for uh, common features from positive examples only. And because, and that's using the same strategy that we use to learn new uh, new object categories. So that's part of what we use, in addition to the network itself being trying to be anatomically consistent. So definitely, like I said, there's the behavioral level, there's the topographical level, and then there's the neuron level. At different levels, there's different things, and you can kind of combine them into this whole big system that we have. <clears throat> can you explain the process of how you identify those features that are more important specific to that particular object identification? Um, yeah, sure. So. What happens is if we have, if we already have a bunch of filters trained from, say, ImageNet, uh, so that means this network, oh, sorry, the question was, can I explain about how to pick those important features for object category? So if you have a neural network that was trained from ImageNet, and you assume that, if you, if you think of that as your lifelong experience of how your brain train, trains your filters, then the, a trained neural network kind of becomes that a feature pool, right? And then, so out of that feature pool, some of them might be uh, like parts of the chair, some of them might be parts of the hat, some of them might, might be parts of the shoe. So, um, and they would line up whenever different, uh, different objects, images pass through the, the network. So what we want to do is, if we, right now, if we want to find the categorical features of a taxi cab, what we do is before a pass of uh, 50, 100 taxi cab images through the network, and then we'll find which feature uh, is, is active most of the time throughout those 100 pictures. If it's active 98 out of 100 times, this is probably an important feature for this category. So this is the frequency uh, part that we, we count. So when you say active, you mean look for certain for value for the weight? So the you look at the feature map. Meaning whenever you pass through the image to a network, a neural will produce an activation, a, a feature map, which is a result of the response to that image. And then you can just kind of, uh, so what we did was we did a global sum of that feature map to see what is the, that, that number to, to, to represent the overall uh, response of that neuron given this image. So if this neuron is highly active out of all the 100 images overall, and also uh, having a low standard deviation, meaning it's active about the same level all the time, and that would be an important neuron for this category. 
So we kind of find, uh, we pick up those neurons from the neural network. There's an automated algorithm there, and that, that's the way how we find categorical features. Um, question. So the brain has, I don't know, 10 billion or 100 billion neurons, and from what I understand, it's like 20% of it is devoted to visual processing, some, some really significant portion. And you're using 729 neurons. Um, have you tried even like 10 million neurons or, uh, I don't know, 100 million neurons, some larger number? Yeah. The question was, uh, our brain has a lot of neurons, so uh, our interest network only has 729. Have we tried larger? Uh, so that would so that would exactly be when we're able to compare with larger state of the networks. Because right now this network, when we started, we wanted to uh, compare with that extent because it was five layers. And therefore, uh, we made our first layer 64, so that it's comparable to Alexander's first layer. And then we, um, we, t we, we figured out how many neurons to give the subsequent layer based on that, based on the ratio of the, uh, of the surface area of, of the, the first visual cortex. So, in the future, we can definitely try to make neurons much larger, and that can also allow us to compare with larger city art and works to be more uh, examples there. Mm -hmm. Question. Uh, hi. Uh, so I work at Wayne Mobile, and uh, so you talk about accuracy, but I also have a question because when in I talk about what, sorry? Uh, the accuracy of the neural network. So I, my question is more focused on the um, mutation of speed, which is like, let me be specific, in simulation environment, so, and then we have a, like a, ma a makeshift. So the, in, the, in terms of like a, a features and a, the response of the time, and the, you know, graph. Uh, are you, so my question is, have you tried any like uh, back propagation and also drop out? Because when, as I see that obviously the v VSNet uh, performed the best. And have you tried the drop out or other Okay. So speed it up. You, because in every nano nanoseconds that counts. So I was really want to want to know if you can find it um, a little bit more uh, speed up, like faster solution. So how many understand? I'm not sure if I understand the, the speed up part. You said that. Uh, like, so if you're running a startup, you want your software to score fast. Edification. You're trying to prune networks, doing dropout. There's a variety of techniques to speed up. Forecasting or inference. Thank you. Is that valid? Yes. yes. That's what I, mean. I see. I see. So, uh, so the question was more about how do we speed up the inference time, the forward pass time of this network, uh, for example, with dropouts or things like that. So during training, we we'll definitely use dropout, the the the, the standard methods, um, because we were concerned about the speed and therefore we didn't do much. But I'm sure we can apply compression techniques to to this network, but I think in the spirit of being biologically inspired, then if we're thinking about making this network more uh, faster, then maybe we think uh, more on a, how, how does it make our brain to process things faster in addition to just parallel, parallelizing all the processing. Um, you know, so that, that, that may or may not be the same techniques of what model compression is doing today. So I, I thought there was a lot of interesting stuff in this talk, by the way. Um, I, I, this idea of looking at um, the, how long it takes people to do visual tasks brings up all sorts of ideas. But um, it, it definitely makes me think of some sort of algorithm that is variable length in time uh, that's going on in the brain. And obviously there's eye tracking, which is pretty relevant to your, your other one. Um, which, which sort of obviously becomes an algorithm, of, uh, you know, but, um, but even without eye tracking, it seems like there'd be an algorithm. So I, I was wondering if you could sort of say maybe what you know of that's known about the brain and sort of the algorithmic aspects that might be involved in, uh, in a um, biological network. Uh, yeah, so that, is there anything that's a big question. The big question is yeah. what do I know about the biological brain that, that, that we could uh, work on to, to build into this further. So I, during my, during my work there, I specifically focused on the visual, modeling the visual uh, categorical search aspects, and we came up with the categorical consistent feature method, which is based on only using positive examples. 
And so that actually we were, we were we were trying to make that into a computer vision work as well because you know if you think about neural network today, when you're training for a new category, say right now you have an image net training neural network, whatever network it may be, right now I have a new category, say, I don't know, it's assuming smartphone is a new category. How do you train that network? You gotta kind of get a thousand uh, smartphone pictures and then you retrain the network with all the data you have, um, you, you fine tune, however you do it. But for us, we feel that um, for us in the brain, we, we don't need to do that because like I said, we don't need, whenever we're looking at a new category, we don't think about the non-category examples. We don't think about what's not a dragon fruit. We just look for the things. So then, what uh, one way to do that is, if we just find category consistent feature, these set of features, um, to describe dragon fruit, that become our object detector. And then if we find another set of features for smartphone from the same network, um, that's active whenever it sees a smartphone picture, then that's um, the smartphone set of, uh, set of pictures, uh, sorry, set of features. And when you just aggregate their, um, their uh, activation plan, then you can get object detection. Then. And that's how, actually what we show, is that this way, you train a network with image data, you don't have to train it again. You just look for features for different categories. And right now, if you're uh, learning a stop sign category, all you need to do is uh, search Google for 100 stop sign images, and then forecast those to the network, find the neurons that are highly activated by these stop signs, and those will just be stop sign features, and that can be used for object detection. So that's something uh, we have preliminary work that I showed, uh, but, but we're also, also working for it. So I think the, the, I don't, I know specific things about the behavior side and neural side, and we're just trying to do a lot of applications there, both in terms of being more uh, bio-inspired as well as to apply them into computer vision. Uh -huh. So I guess uh, on that again, I mean, is there, do you know if there's evidence that um, people get more accurate at classification if they, are able to spend more time on the same recogni recognition task? Uh, the question is if you I mean, can get more accurate. I mean, is that, more? Is that some think, study? <laughs> I mean, is that, okay. If you practice yeah. more, you probably get more accurate. Well, not just practice, but I mean, like, you know, if I if I know it's important for me to get it right, I might think about it longer, right? So, so I might uh, I might get more. You know, I might be able to get a an eighty percent accuracy in half a second but I might be able to get a 98% accuracy if I spend three seconds thinking about yeah, it. Possibly. So, yeah, possibly. Yeah, maybe some different mechanism. Because that's yeah. certainly something that doesn't happen with our, our artificial deep yeah. learning networks right now, you know? Yeah, there's a whole speed accuracy trade-off, uh, mm -hmm. like studies on, on cognitive, in cognitive psychology showing, showing speed accuracy trade-off. So if you flash a, something quickly and then flash something else behind it, um, if you have more processing time, you're going to be more accurate. And, and it also uh, is related to how difficult the recognition task, which that's related to how similar things in the background are to the foreground. And so there's a whole right. literature. So there's a lot to be inspired there, actually, yes. in terms of having a, yes. our deep learning networks be able to vary like that. Yeah. That's neat. OK. <laughs> so uh, earlier, you mentioned um, how the term AI has become very prevalent. And um, I presume you would agree that uh, we're not really doing AI yet, we're still doing machine learning. Is, uh, and my question has to do with the fact that, you know, the public perception of things like AI is driven by things like the Terminator movies. And do you have a thought about how we could tell people uh, something that would show them the difference between AI, as in the Terminator movies, and machine learning as it exists yeah. today. The, the question was uh, the AI today versus uh, what we are, are achieving today versus the AI in Terminator movies. Uh, uh, so I think how how different are they, or how do they uh, how, how do they explain that difference? Yeah, how, how do they explain the difference? I think the AI in Terminator is more like general. In general intelligence rather than the AI we have today. And also, I think it's also just how we call it. Like you can call, people call, use machine learning for to describe something. People use AI to describe something. It, it really is just based on how people use it today um, in terms of meaning. But I think in terms of what we're working on today, uh, we are so far from Terminator AI because we can only recognize. I, mean, I, I understand that us, right? we know that. The people in this room know that. but. Unfortunately, there are people out there who 
only see the Terminator movies, and they hear the term AI being used all the time. And so what I'm asking is, have you any thoughts as to how to uh, tell people the difference between machine learning, as though it's very advanced today, and AI like in the Terminator? I see. So the question is, how do I t tell people the difference between the AI today versus the AI movies? Um, the AI today can only recognize things, do simple tasks, uh, classify things, recognize. Uh, it cannot reason, but in the movies it can reason, it can make decisions, and uh, that's much more than what we can do today. And with today's architecture, the type of loss function, the type of architecture, the type of network we have, I think we're still a long way unless we really look for different things. For example, I think one thing I find really fascinating is uh, you know, kids, they can learn. Again, I draw a lot of inspiration from my kid because I see them growing up, I see them picking up different things, that's amazing. I can never build a um, neural network to do that. They learn a language over, what, a year and a half, and they can speak it fluently. Right now, if we go through the same environment, we cannot do that. So that means your brain is pre-wired in a certain way such that it's able to pick up that information and generalize that way. And so I think I personally am really interested in really looking for those pre-wiring structure to see if, if we find those pre-wired structure in the brain that allows this language learning, those unsupervised learning, uh, because we can point, say that's truck, and then they, they'll pick it up. They also learn by your gesture, right? A lot of them, these are not really supervised learning. Uh, so I think you have a hard, hard-wired brain that, can, that, that, that does that learning, and if we're able to figure out that wiring, yeah. Maybe, and then just send it through all the different videos and different things. Maybe it can pick up what the kids are learning. I think that can maybe move uh, closer to general. So, AI. so I understand the difference between AI and machine learning, and everyone else here probably does. Uh, and I guess I want to. Um, I'll just state my opinion that the idea of calling things AI these days is dangerous because it misleads people into thinking that it, we're further along than it is. So, okay. just to state it, thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, what are the specific use cases that VSNet can be applied compared to like, uh, let's say, written on it or YOLO or something? Yeah, so, this, uh, so, so the question is what are the other use cases VSNet can be used? So it can be used as a base of any kind of recognition, classification, detection task. It's just whether it'll be good or not. And I don't think it'll be very good because it wasn't designed for that purpose, but uh, definitely interesting to try. Yeah. But what is the specific area that this architecture can be applied or can be? So you can start again? What is the specific use case that we can use it in real life? So the question is what are the specific use cases we can use in real life? In, in VSNet's case, it's not, it was designed to, to, ver to, to verify a, a, a human task. And then if it is able to do that, then we can dig back in to see maybe this actually tells us more about how the brain works in a certain way. So this, so not only this helps uh, the computer vision side, but it's, it's, it's can also help the neuroscience side. So it's, it was more meant for that way rather than, uh, rather than when you say use case, I think you're talking about the computer vision tasks, um, not so much there. It, it can do it, but it's not going to be great. Because ultimately, the number of neurons are very few. And the abstraction of the layers is very rough. And there's a lot of more details you can be coming to. And there's no lateral connection, there's no feedback connection, there's no map structure, there's a lot of things missing here. So it's the first attempt to really just try to use whatever we know about the brain and build it in and see what happens. And then, and then there's going to be follow-up steps there. Um, how, were, how were you measuring those milliseconds sort of like uh, how soon we detect the, the basic object of superordinate or subordinate objects? Uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, how do you, how, what kind of mechanism are you using to detect those speeds like at which you are very recognizing the objects? What kind of mechanism are we using to detect the reaction time yes. of uh, categorical search in humans? The, the, sub, the, the study that you have done with some people. With, with humans? Yeah. So we show them pictures. We first show them the query, which is the airplane. And then they'll look for the airplane. So what they have, they have a button pressed, and they can press. Whenever they find the airplane, they press the button. So what we do is we measure two things. One is how long does it take for their eye to to land on the target? That's the first number we we say. That's called time to target. 
And the second number we, uh, we record is after the high uh, length on the target, how much time the, then do they take until they press the button? So that's a verification time. So those two things are what we record and we try to predict with our model. Okay, thank you everyone for your time. Okay.